Gold Rush Girl. We're on chapter 38. The constant steady lapping of the lazy little waves against the island shore measured our time. Cold, I wrapped my braid around my neck like a scarf and hugged my body while resting my chin on my drawn up knees. My hair felt heavy and dirty. My scalp itched. I was also starving, but I wasn't going to say anything about that. I'm sure the boys were just as uncomfortable. No one spoke a complaint. Sitting there, once again, I could almost hear father saying to me, try and act a little ladylike. What would mother think if she could see me? I even thought about Aunt Lavinia. What would she say if she knew what I was up and about? She would have an eruption. The thought of it made me smile. But then with a plunging heart, I knew that if I, that if we didn't rescue Jacob, I must be the one to tell them and it would be ghastly. From time to time, we passed the telescope between us, studying the Yankee sword, but saw nothing of note. I was certain that those boats with the crew that had left the Yankee sword and headed for the city had not returned. There could, however, be no doubt at some point they would return. I suspect I briefly, once or twice, nodded into sleep. I jerked awake. The lights on the Yankee sword looked to be brighter. I asked myself, was it because my eyes were fixed upon them so steadily? Or was it the fog beginning to thin? I decided the fog was thinning. We must move. I grew excited even as I felt hollow in my stomach. When the fog fully went, so too would the Yankee sword. Once again, that old urgency, a need to do something came. Trying to keep my voice steady, I said, what time do you think it is? Two, three, Sam answered. I stood up and looked around toward the gate. The fog seemed to have melted away. The fog is gone, I announced. The boys stood up and looked for themselves. After a moment, Sam said, means as soon as there's some daylight, that crew will be back. Which also means, I added, the Yankee sword will go. Likely, said Thad. Sam said, as I see it, even if they were worried about us, they wouldn't think we'd go out there now, not now. They might even believe we're still locked up on that rotten ship. I waited a few moments and then I said, <clears throat> then we should get on her now. Fine with me, said Sam. Yeah, said Thad. That was all it took to reach that monumentous agreement. Even so, we continued to stand there gazing at the Yankee sword. It was as if we needed to measure, not just the distance from where we were to the ship, but our own courage as well. It was me at last who said, let's go. Thad said, odds look good, to which Sam added, I'm ready. We lit my lantern, but kept the flame small. Moving with care, we climbed down over the island rocks to the water's edge, taking one another's hands when necessary. It was a fact. We three had come to work so well together that there was no need to talk. It took all of us to get the rowboat off the rocks and back into the water. We held the line to keep the bobbing rowboat from floating away. Thad, who had the longest legs, waded out and clambered on. Once set, he pulled the line to get her closer to shore. With a jump from a shoreline rock, Sam boarded her. I was left holding the line. Once he got on, I also leaped aboard. Sam, Sam steadying me as I landed. Thad rowed us to where the Sadie Rose was anchored. When he got on, I tied the rowboat to the stern. And here they are on it. As before, Sam was at the catch tiller and took command. Under his orders, Thad and I hauled up the mainsail, then the mizzen. Through the wind, though the wind was light, our sails fluttered and filled. The tiller shifted. The boom swung around and Sam pointed us right in the direction of the Yankee sword's lights. We were on our way. In the pre-dawn, the darkest time of the day, the bay seemed immense and our little vessel small. Waters were calm, broken here and there by flashing flicks of foam. The air was moist, but the fog continued to wane. Like awakening eyes, multiple stars began to appear above. 
The moon, still woolly, began to brighten and gain an edge, even as feathery clouds streaked across its face. We were about two miles from the city, but I could see more lights. Most important of all, we were drawing even nearer to the Yankee sword. As we sailed along, I thought, Miss Tory, do you understand that you are about to steal upon a ship in the middle of the night? You are like a pirate. I recalled what Senor Rosales had warned, that what we were going to do was peligroso, dangerous. Si, muy peligroso. Would it be wrong to make a confession? At that moment, yes, I was scared, but I was also truly thrilled to be part of this adventure. Sam had us tacking back and forth across a light, moist wind, with Thad and me periodically ducking the swinging boom. No one spoke. The only sounds were slight ruffling of sails and the slap of our bow as the Sadie Rose spanked through the water. Slip, slap, slap. The spray of water kept me alert. Not that I ever took my eyes from the safety lights on the Yankee sword. At first they appeared far away, but as the Sadie Rose drew even nearer, they became bigger, stronger, and brighter. I began to see the outline of the ship a long, low, black shadow against the deeper dark, an island of darkness. From time to time, Thad turned and looked toward the city. I looked too. There were only a few lights, nothing moving. What are you looking at? I asked. Want to make sure the crew isn't returning. You think they will? Absolutely, called Sam from the helm. By first light. But he didn't look toward the city the way Thad and I did. Perhaps he didn't wish to. I decided he was nervous the way I was, but I chose not to ask. I gazed up. The moon kept growing bigger, clearer, even as it lowered into the western sky. I could see the Yankee sword with increasing clarity. Her masts, her spars, her furled sails, her safety lights never moved. I saw no sign of life on her. I kept wondering how many of the crew had remained on board for the watch. It abruptly occurred to me, if I saw them with any such clarity, they could just as well see us. Wasn't that what keeping a watch meant? We drew closer. Sam sailed the catch around the Yankee sword's bow, dodging her anchor line, which was holding the big ship fast. Simultaneously, I reminded myself that we had made no plans for how to board her. Only then did I have yet another thought. What if Jacob is not on her? I whispered, what do we do now? Thad, his low voice said, get aboard, all of us. Sam said, someone needs to take care of the catch. If anyone on the Yankee sword steals her, we'll be dead in the water, and I mean dead. I have to go on, I said. Thad said, I'll stay. Sam knows ships better than me. Can you handle the catch? Asked Sam. I've been watching you, said Thad. Huh, muttered Sam. Though I was tense and excited, the boys seemed quite casual. I doubted they felt the same way. They must have been masking their worriment. Sam edged the catch until we were close to the Yankee sword. Next moment, we jolted softly against her hull. Not the city side, I noticed, but the bay side. Smart. So if the crew returned, we would less likely to be seen by them since they would be coming from the city. All this to say, we had arrived. I don't think my senses had ever been so alert. Now we needed to board her. Chapter 39. Thad stood up in the bow of the catch, low lit lantern in hand in search of lines hanging from the Yankee sword. He found them easily enough, most likely the ones that had been used to let the crew's boats down when they had gone to the city. He grabbed two ropes, pulling them hard to make sure they held. When they did, he passed one to Sam, who tied it to a cleat on the bow of the Sadie Rose. The other line went to our stern and that kept us stable. I worked to drop our sails, we now held fast to the Yankee sword. Speaking softly, Sam said, no talking unless we have to. 
remember, remember, they'll have someone on board, maybe more than someone. What about light? I asked. Her safety lights will have to do. I'll keep my lantern, said Thad. That way, you'll know where to come back to. If we come back, Sam muttered. You will, said Thad. Then he added, Tori, give me your flint in case my lamp goes out. Briefly, we stood there in our catch. The Sadie rose. She rocked, but far less than my beating heart was rocking. In the faint yellow light of Thad's little lantern, we looked at one another as if only then were we fully aware of what we were daring to do. I think only then did I allow myself to acknowledge we were actually going to board her. It was Thad who put out a hand. I put a hand on his and Sam put his hand atop mine. And without any words, it was understood. Bright hearts and faint light. Oh, how much then did I truly love my two friends. God keep us, Sam whispered. Amen, said Thad. To which I actually said, our will is our destiny. Just to say, just to say it sent a cold quiver through me. I'll go first, said Sam. I'll be quicker. He reached as high as he could on one of the free lines. Using both hands, he hoisted himself up on the ropes from the deck of the Sadie Rose. Then he began to walk and pull himself aloft. Thad and I, in the catch of the Sadie Rose, watched him, his shadow go before him. When he reached the top gallant rail, he swung over, and then he vanished from sight. It seemed forever before I saw, if dimly, Sam's head pop up. He didn't call or speak, but he made a waving motion. I understood. Things so far were safe. It was my turn to climb. Thad touched me on my back, leaned forward, and whispered into my ear, Good luck. Heart hammering, I reached up and grabbed the loose line as high as I could with two hands as I had done before. Then, with all my strength, I hauled myself up from the Sadie Rose's catch deck. As soon as my feet had nothing beneath them, I swung them flat against the Yankee Swords hull and began to pull and walk up. My efforts were not as hard as the first time I climbed that ship in Rotten Row. Not to say it was easy, but I had a sure sense of what I was doing and just how difficult it was. Which is to say, I knew I could do it. I knew I had to do it. Thus, with some swiftness, I moved up and I did not look down, not once. I grasped the top gallant rail. Sam was waiting, two hands extended, he helped me up and over. Next moment, I was standing near him on the deck of the Yankee sword, my legs full of trembles, but no more so than my heart. I went back to the rail, looked over and down. Thad was standing on the catch, peering up. I waved. He waved back. As I watched, he made the flame on his lantern even smaller in hopes that if anyone was looking out from shore, he would not be seen. A tap to my shoulder made me swing around to face Sam. He gave a nod. I understood. We needed to move. Turning from him, I gazed about the ship. Sam had been right. The glowing lantern hanging from a lower spar cast enough shadowy light to allow us to see most of the main deck, and the moonlight helped. There was almost no color, just light and dark. The ship's only movement was a gentle rise and fall. The deck was cluttered, Nothing such as might be called ship shape, but among the vessels, usual paraphernalia, lines and standing blocks, and all the like of which lay disordered about the deck, we saw no one, nor there at first appeared to be any place in which someone might hide. As we stood there gazing about, there was almost complete silence, a silence broken by the occasional thrum of the rigging lines and wires, plus chairs and turnbuckles making some rattles. Bay water flip-flopped against the ship. The quiet enhanced these meager sounds and put brittle edges to my nerves as if my nerves were being plucked. 
I reminded myself there had to be someone on the ship keeping watch. What's more, the ship's safety lights were meant not only to protect the Yankee sword, but also to guide the crew coming back from the city. At some point, they absolutely would come. We needed to hurry. We had yet to move when Sam noticed the box-like structure near the stern. He nudged me and pointed. It had a window, and within the box, we saw a feeble light. When I studied it, I could see the top edge of a spooked steering wheel. From where I stood, I could see no one. Sam whispered in my ear, steering house, need to look. We would have to draw much closer if we, if we were to see if anyone was in there. Walking side by side, we moved toward the stern, working hard to be as quiet as possible. We soon reached the small structure. Being taller than Sam, I stood on my toes and peeked inside. What I saw was a man on the floor, sprawled on his back. His eyes were closed. On his rising and falling chest lay a Colt pistol. I could hear his loud snoring and I saw some white spittle on his lips. But the man's feet, sorry, by the man's feet was a tipped over whiskey bottle. It appeared empty. To one side stood an oil lantern with a small burning flame. The flame enclosed in a hurricane glass to keep it from blowing out. As far as I could guess, the man was in a deep sleep. But the instant I saw him, I knew who he was. The man with the crooked nose, the one in the police station, the man who had seen me outside the tent, the one I supposed had followed us to Rotten Row and locked Sam and me up. Jacob's jailer. To see him took away any remaining doubts. My brother was on this ship. I gestured to Sam, wanting him to have a look. Standing on dead eye, Sam did. Then he backed away and gazed at me with great intensities. I mouthed the word, cramp. He nodded. We both understood. We now knew there was at least one person aboard and that person was armed. It was obvious we needed to move faster. Where? I mouthed that word rather than saying it. Sam's reply was a wave of his hand, signaling me to follow. As we went along the deck, he pointed out two companions, fore and aft. Both were open. I looked down into the aft one. That means left and right. There were steps leading down. Below, faint light glowed, a lit lantern, I supposed, which allowed me to see the deck beneath the last step, the tween deck. Sam pointed. He was going below. When he did, I trailed after, descending into the heart of the ship. We reached the bottom step. Hanging from the timbered ceiling was an oil lamp, which swung with the ship's slight rising and falling motion, as is as if to suggest that time was moving quickly. Timbers creaked. The lamp's flame was small, but shed enough light for me to see the bulky trunks of two masts that rose up below and through the ceiling. Between these mainsails was a double row of open sleeping berths. From where we stood, it took no more than a glance to see that they were empty. There were also long tables and benches. Most of the deck space, however, was taken up along the port and starboard sides by something like 40 doors, all of which were closed. Sam came up to me, leaned close to my ear, pointed to the doors and whispered, staterooms. I understood. If Jacob was being held on board, more than likely, he would be in one of these rooms. Oh my gosh, it's getting so intense. But I have to stop there because we're already at 20 minutes and it gets too hard to upload them after that. All right, I promise I'll read again soon. Stay tuned.